I was taking up Sanskrit courses at the university. What are your thoughts on, on therefore, like how much language and interpretation of language can affect the production or negation of philosophy? Learn Nyamanganam, Jabhan, Gardadash, Jabba Gardadash. Go to any mission, any temple, any whatever it may be, editor, mm -hmm. and the Sanskrit translations are different. Yeah, that is Shastra. That is Shastra, which is static. It's in place. But the living Sadhguru, you cannot re apply any rules to him. The trivial act of him wearing fancy earrings suddenly becomes an act that leads you to the perception of the truth that lies beneath the falsehood. Jai Gurudev. Jai Gurudev. Welcome, Sahadeva Ananda. I'm very happy that you're here. Nice to be here. Thanks well, for having me. Most welcome. One more member from the Knowledge Team. So we've had uh, Myron, Akash, Rishabh Parva, now yourself. Um, not many left to complete the set. No. So I'm, uh, you know, we've worked together now for a year, two years, something like that. And um, you're, in a, you're a knowledge department worker, but you're also a knowledge teacher. And it's been a, it's been a pleasure working with you this, this past sort of year, two years. It's been really nice. And I'd like to allow you to introduce yourself and how you ended up working with me, how you ended up here. Um, so that people can get a background and then we can dive into the topics that we're going to handle today. Sure. I mean, this Knowledge Seva started, I guess really started last March, which is pretty much exactly one year ago, right? As of recording, which is uh, which was when I came here to the ashram, right? I had been initiated as a brahmachari like half a year prior to that. And... Obviously, my my journey with Guruji and Bhakti Marga starts much earlier than that, right? So um, he entered my life when I was just a kid, and yeah, I was I was fortunate enough to still know him from from back then and from let's say a different perspective how how I would see him now. Let's say you know in the beginning I didn't see him as my guru but just some, someone who I just felt really, really connected to and really close to. But at that time, I'd, maybe most people at the time, <laughs> even in Bhakti Marga, didn't really have this understanding what a guru is or what a mm -hmm. Satguru is. And he revealed this role in my life much, much later when I was actually, you know, I guess when I was ready for that. You know, and then he took on this role as my, as my Satguru, which was 2016. Mm -hmm. And yeah, ever since then, it's been an interesting journey. <laughs> nice, nice. I mean, this, um, it's a funny thing because somebody asked me the question a couple of days ago as well. Like, when did you know he was your guru? And then I had to sort of reflect and realize that it was quite a bit after knowing him. Right, mm. so those two things don't happen at the same time, and and even your point, the, our understanding of what a guru is also changes. And so, even when I did figure out he was my guru, which concept of a guru, and then like how that evolved and and everything else. So that's that's an interesting insight. Um, how old were you when you met him? I was eight. Eight. Wow. So that was uh, two thousand four. So, yeah, pretty much twenty years ago. That's amazing. I did not know that. Yeah. I assumed, because I remember, I remember you when you were, I guess, already a teenager at that yeah, point. Yeah. But but eight, like, that's nice, nice. <laughs> Surprising information. Um, what's your what's your uh, educational background? I know you, you studied um, Sanskrit, which is one of the topics that we're also going to get mm -hmm. into on this side. But tell me a bit about that. How did you, right. um, shortly before you got here, so what was your life like those, those couple of years, two, three years before you got here? Right. So... I grew up in Germany, but actually I was, uh, I finished high school there and then I moved to Switzerland to study there. Mm -hmm. Initially I started mechanical engineering in Zurich, only to figure out that it doesn't really work with me. But at the time I was 18 and I didn't have, I just wanted to move to another place. Let's say I wanted to get out of <laughs> living, you know, at home. And I didn't know, honestly, I didn't know what else to do, what else to study. I was always good with math and, you know, these, these sciences, let's mm -hmm. say, 
always had a thing for that. So I thought, or I had heard from a friend, he recommended it to me, that it'd be a great thing to study. So I thought, okay, why not? Um, and then, yeah, eventually I figured out that it's really not for me. It, it's, it was very, very difficult. And it was something I was completely not passionate about. Right. So this combination is just a recipe for failure somehow. That's death right there. Death right? to the soul. It's super difficult, but you're also, you don't have the passion for it. You don't have the drive for it. Yeah. So eventually I took these after, after one year and there were exams, I failed those exams. And I initially I thought, okay, I'll, I'll repeat them next year. But during that period, I was kind of really in a, in a period of self search, let's mm -hmm. say, or what I want to do with my life which ultimately actually led me back to Guruji. I was never away from him, but he he is, you know, he's been in my life for such a long time, but there was never an active um, intention from my side to commit to a certain path or to really accept him as a guru, right? But during that time, in like, which was a bit of a, not really a crisis, but just a period of, of searching, you know, searching for something. I was, I remember at that time where, where I had a lot of time because I, mm -hmm. you know, I was still enrolled in university and I was working on the side a little bit, but um, I had a lot of time and I was reading a lot of, a lot of books. I was definitely searching. I didn't really understand exactly what I was searching for. But I just wanted to figure out life. How does you know, how does the economy work? How does science work? How does this universe work? What am I here for? And all these these eventually then led me to led me to back quote unquote mm. to Guruji. And but during that year, I figured out that I actually have a thing for you know soft like programming uh, computers like software, mm -hmm. and so. I was I was still staying in Zurich and I just studied I started studying computer science at the University of Zurich. It was like a joint program between computer science and there were also some economic courses. But mostly uh yeah that nice nice. There's an insight you made there that I think um I don't want to let it go over people's heads. I mean when you talked about um you were with Guruji and you're never away from him but at the same right. time that shift happened and I think a lot of people need to realize that it's one thing to have a guru or mm -hmm. Guruji as an auxiliary presence in your life mm -hmm. that um, inspires you, that, that you know, loosely guides you, and then having him become the guiding principle. Mm -hmm. So in a sense where you um, recognize his um, higher knowledge or higher understanding even mm -hmm. of yourself, mm -hmm. let alone the world, and allow him to then guide your, your steps and actions. And I think it's a very different way. And in both cases, the person will say, I have a guru. Yeah. Right. And I think that statement, I have a guru, doesn't mean the same thing and isn't understood the same by different people in different life circumstances. So that's a that's an important distinction, yeah. I think, there that how you you mentioned earlier how um you know you can have a guru in your life, but for for your personal for your personal life, um that it you know, the question is when when does he really become my guru, right? Even though he's there in life, but right. Yeah, yeah. Taking the worst of thing, and uh, personally, I had a really strong experience with that during that time because Guruji was uh, coming to Munich, and my mom was one of the organizers of that darshan. She's also a devotee, mm -hmm. and um, so that previous night, so the d night before the darshan, we had um, we were invited to a dinner with Guruji, and I had not seen him for. I don't know, maybe three years. I remember that dinner. Right? And I I remember this so clear, like this anticipation of waiting for him outside of the restaurant and then him finally coming. And as soon as the car pulled up, there was such a, just, I cannot even describe it. It's like maybe now when you come for a darshan, such a, such a, such a palpable excitement and magic and then the moment he stepped out of that car, it was so c crystal clear that that he was what I was, what what I had been searching. And there was such a strong feeling of 
belonging, like, and and in a more in in some way, I was questioning myself, like, why was I staying away from that for such a long time? Why did I not recognize that in him earlier? But it was just not, it was just not time. You know? mm. It was just not time. Now we would call that recognition. Sure, but I think timing <laughs> is is. Um, too quickly dismissed by people mm. when they ask these kind of questions. Why hasn't this happened yet? Why this? Why that? And I think Guruji always points out that people never ask why when something good happens at the time that they want it. And they never go, why did it happen now exactly when I want it? They only ask that kind of stuff when it doesn't happen. But but I think time is is an under underrated factor, underestimated factor in in changing our ability to engage with the same substance in a different way. Because it, it's it's remarkable the way that we we can read the Gita once, read it five years later and have a completely different experience as if you never read it before. Right. It, it's And there's so many things where this happens. It's going to temples, getting the darshan of the same deity day after day. Mm. You look at the same deity, you, it hasn't changed really. Mm. I mean, okay, the clothes, but, mm. and yet the feeling is different all mm. the time. And, and the time factor is, um, yeah, I don't want to go too much on a tangent, but it's a huge, it's a huge point. Something to unpack at a later date. But okay, you when you came here, am I correct in understanding that when you arrived at SPN, not only were had you been initiated, but that you you came already with the intention to work or the instruction to work in the knowledge department? Yeah, that was already an instruction. So this, let's say, tell me how that happened. Yeah, yeah maybe the seed of that instruction happened um, while I was still in my in my bachelor's, mm -hmm. and. I had a chance to talk to Guruji and he was asking how my studies were going. I thought they, you know, they were going fine. And I, I was kind of wondering whether I should um, continue my studies, you know, do a master's. In computer after. sciences at this point. Right, yeah. yeah. And he said, yeah, sure, if you have the opportunity to do so, it's good to have an education like that. And then he gave an inter interesting instruction. He said, but I also would like you to study the bhakti path. And in that moment, I wasn't entirely sure, honestly, what he meant exactly, how I would do that or what, what he meant. So I, I asked a follow-up question, like, do you mean study the scriptures? Or I said, yeah, yeah, study, study the scriptures. And yeah, so I was, I was trying to dive, dive into the matter of, of course, Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavatam, Guruji's, all of Guruji's books, but then trying to dive deeper into the broader broader landscape broader landscape of Vaishnavism mm -hmm. of Sanat and Dharma in general which then eventually led me to a wish of studying Sanskrit right because I was reading for instance Bhagavad Gita and just I had a thing for, I had a liking for the language somehow there was somehow an attraction and yeah I just had this wish to go a little bit deeper into that side of things Two questions that immediately pop in my mind. I think the first one is when Guruji gives an instruction like that. Mm -hmm. And I asked this, I think when I was talking to Vrishabh Parva as well, it was how do you recommend that somebody really acts that out? Because it nice that you got it directly, but I think indirectly, most people have that instruction mm -hmm. in, in a sense of not in a personal way, but generally Guruji mm -hmm. says that it's important to, to get knowledge and to dive into the Bhakti path and to study. And so one thing is, of course, you have to pick up the, the books and read. Right. But what I had mentioned to him was, what is the value of other people along that journey that you can interact with and mm -hmm. question and, and sort of mm -hmm. trade ideas with? And I think he actually mentioned you at mm -hmm. that time, that, mm -hmm. that that was something that at times that he would um, message you, like discussing different interpretations or different things like yeah, this. Yeah, we would and discuss so a lot, yeah. How, how, what role did that play, do you think? Like that, that Sangha element, or like even if it's just one person, but just having somebody like, propelling each other or like is that something that you think is important well having a a sangha in that sense is super important and if you don't have it then there's always a way to make it mm. that's a, you know? okay talk to me about that a little bit what because, do, you, how do you think that happens or how would you do it because if if you're not spreading your message then the world is going to spread your their message to you right yes because we might be surrounded with so many people who have, you know, their own interests, their own 
things playing in their head and they will naturally share that, you know, whatever's inside of us. That's the only thing that comes out, right? So if we just share our path in some way, then, then we can create a Sangha, even if we don't have it, right? Because, you know, these, these principles which are in Shastra, which are in the Bhagavad Gita, they're not just Hindu, right? But everyone can take them and become a better human being firstly, right? No matter where you're from. Because these are, you know, this profound wisdom which the Sadhguru gives, which the scriptures give, is for every living being, no? I always, I, I agree with you. And then I sometimes think, uh, but everybody thinks the same about their religion and their scripture. Like, you know, people who follow the Bible, Christians would look at that and say, but this is for everyone. Sure. This is the wisdom for everyone. And then the same thing with the Quran and the same thing across all scripture. And it's not that it's not true. Mm -hmm. And I think that's not in their heads. I mean, that I don't, I don't disbelieve that they really believe that mm -hmm. is what I'm saying. And then I think, what is the, the road to to getting someone to really understand the universality of certain principles. Mm -hmm. Because I think people get caught up when they, they find these kind of statements intellectually dishonest sometimes, mm -hmm. because they're like, well, clearly it's not for everyone, because if you look at this statement or that statement, mm -hmm. you know, that's very specific, it's niche, it's, it's saying mm -hmm. that you need to believe in this in order to do this, or people start to pick those statements apart, right? And I think that the the mature understanding of that kind of statement is that there is a commonality, there is a common ground, and it tends to lie on the human element of it, on the human conduct right. element, on the human values, not so much on the on the transcendent, on the supernatural right. dimension. Mm -hmm. And I think that needs to be more clearly said to people. Like, mm -hmm. look, when we talk about this is for everyone, we don't mean everyone must believe and accept yeah. Krishna as the Supreme Lord no. now. That would be nice for everyone also, but that's not what I, at least not what I mean. And I, and I think you, you don't mean that either. Mm -hmm. I think the universality of it and, and the way that you can often connect with people and create that Sangha mm -hmm. is by, by touching on, on those universal principles of, of human conduct and, and, and solving the more basic human needs before we can start aiming at loftier goals in a sense. Mm -hmm. And, and that's my experience also. That when I when I try to connect with people that don't have a natural attraction or affinity to this kind of thing, mm -hmm. to really start from the angle of, let's understand what it is that afflicts you then, and let's understand how we can universally solve this irrespective of our faiths, mm -hmm. because we'll start to discover that those solutions are pretty uh, um, universal. Right. Yeah, and yeah. So uh, not to again go off on a tangent, but nice nice to hear that um, that is something that you also. Um, agree on because from my point of view my conversations with someone like myron for example mm -hmm. in my early journey into studying mm -hmm. the path of bhakti as guruji said to you they were things that um they weren't the reason i did it but they helped me immeasurably mm -hmm. because they pushed me and pushed me and pushed me and i think it plays at our our ego a little bit as well or like the human tendency to to compete or to mm -hmm. compare or to like you know and it almost becomes playful where you want to get one up on your friend and you're like oh but i like i see this meaning or that or here's mm -hmm. another verse that you know counteracts that and you almost play fight you know like you playfully create a, a motivation to go deeper into it and to just really get there and and it was really helpful for my case and i'm you know i'm glad if others share their own experiences to get people to get people together and get people studying right. so you mentioned it, it created an attraction for for sanskrit yes what happened there how did, how did that <laughs> attraction become something yes yeah, what honest. happened so i had a friend at university and i was aware that at the university there were certain courses they had this southeast asia institute at the at the university mm -hmm. So um, they had lots of courses on Hinduism, you know, different different branches, or let's say different different kinds of courses, but also Sanskrit courses, right? So uh, I connected there with with someone, and he told me of a Sanskrit teacher in the city, and I was I was quite intrigued because. 
it, I saw it as a golden opportunity to to dive into it because um Sure, learning online. Well, this was before COVID. Mm -hmm. Now everything's shifting more and more online, yeah. right? But um, back in back in the day, <laughs> pre-COVID, <laughs> pre-COVID, <laughs> yeah, pre-COVID, sure. everything was much more, uh, you know, in real world. And yeah, it was it was a great opportunity to have someone who would who would teach. I I didn't know exactly what how he would be teaching and whatever, but. Um, But but so yeah, I, I I basically signed up for that course. He didn't he didn't charge anything. You could, uh, you oh. could. Why well, actually? Let me. Remember. <laughs> actually, wait him? a minute. I paid a lot. No. <laughs> I think he he was accepting like a small donation. Got it. Yeah. But he was he was definitely not making it, uh, you know, as a as a business. Let's Accessible, say. like right. Yeah, he yeah. was not he was not living off of that. Mm -hmm. Let's say mm -hmm. you know, he was just a, a complete enthusiast. Let's say. And um, yeah, so there the this this journey of learning Sanskrit started. Initially, it started with maybe twenty people were there for the first class, and then over over the weeks, over time, really it 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 was dropping quite dramatically, quite quite drastically, which is something I've I've always seen whenever people want to learn Sanskrit. <laughs> they might not know what they're getting themselves into and so we were starting from 20 people down to 10 down to nine eight seven six and then it was really only three of us left and um it was quite it was quite an experience so the the lessons would happen at his house at his home basically and it's, I, i've never seen such a room really The whole room, it was quite a small room, but the whole room was covered with either books or posters of some Sanskrit rules, some derivations, some it was it was like a library, but more packed, let's say. A real enthusiast. <laughs> with flip charts, with like any like it was it was crazy. Really an enthusiast. And um, what he was teaching us was actually the Ashtadhyay of Panini. So it's the, it was uh, in like, let's say a very traditional approach, a very traditional Sanskrit kind of education. And okay, so for example, you said that at the university there was departments mm -hmm. teaching Hinduism, different things. Right. Maybe, maybe... I mean, I, I'm aware of many university departments who teach Sanskrit courses as mm -hmm. well. And so, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, that his teaching method was was traditional or what he was teaching was particularly traditional. Yeah. Tell me maybe if you have any insights into this, what, what would be the difference of studying with someone like that or in that way and then going mm -hmm. to university and taking a course in Sanskrit, like methodology in terms of like right. how to, to get that across? Mm -hmm. I mean, the methodology of traditional learning, this traditional Vedic learning and the modern learning is quite, quite different from, from my own experience. So maybe I can give you a little flavor of this, this Ashtadhyay and how he would teach mm -hmm. us, mm -hmm. right? So this Ashtadhyay is, you can say it's almost like the Bible or the Holy Grail of Sanskrit grammar. Mm -hmm. And it contains around 4,000 sutras. Mm -hmm. And it was written, in conservative estimates say like 2,500 years ago. Yeah. And since then, it's completely unchanged, and it's still the by absolute Panini, by Panini. Yes, right. by Panini, mm -hmm. and it's still the absolute reference for for Sanskrit grammar, mm -hmm. right? And in these four thousand sutras, he really explains the entire language, and the way he does it is by let's say giving you recipes. How, for instance, to derive certain inflected forms or, or verb forms mm -hmm. from Sanskrit roots. Yeah. And he really describes the entire, entire grammar. And with my, with my computer science background, I found it quite amazing how at that time he could do something like that. You know, it really has a flavor of computational linguistics. Okay. So this this Ashtadhyay is actually based 
on the Maheshwar Sutras. And so these Maheshwar Sutras, which are believed to have been given by Shiva himself, that's Maheshwar is another name for Shiva, and it's actually believed that he was playing his Damaru, and from these from these sounds emerged these 14 sutras, right? So it's Ayun, Rilak, Eong, Ayaut, Hayavarat, Larn, Nyamangananam, Jabhan, Gadadash, Jabha Gadadash, Kapa, Charta, Tha, Charta, Tav, Kapai, Shashasar, Hal. So it's these 14 sutras. And the way Panini works with them is that he will, for instance, say, um, an. And by an, he means a, e, u. Right? And so you have to understand that these Sanskrit grammarians were so concerned to make their grammar as concise, as brief as possible. No, that's that's a sutra. It should be very, very dense, concise, yeah, dense. very conci concise. And there's even a saying that if a grammarian can reduce his sutra by a small amount, he celebrates it like the birth of a child. Right? So my Sanskrit teacher would tell a lot of these anecdotes. And these Maheshwara Sutras give a framework for um, referencing Pratyaharas. So for instance, when you say Ach, instead of listing all the vowels, you just say Ach, because Ach goes from a i un relik e ong ai au ch. So basically, if you write down the sutras, then you start with the first uh, letter mm -hmm. and you go to, to the last letter, right? So he creates a certain meta language. For instance, when he says hal, he r r means all the consonants. And it's very, very similar to how a uh, computer code works, right? Where you have certain variables and you also have a certain meta language. For instance, when you have programming lang language like C++, for instance, you have... A right, key so you would equate a programming language as a meta language in this case. Right. Or, uh, like a, a unique language that helps you unpack or understand. In a sense, no. In, for instance, in a computer language, you have certain reserved keywords. Mm -hmm. Right. For instance, if you want to have an integer number mm -hmm. in C++, that's an int, for instance, right. or float, or you have these certain, or bool, or char, it depends on the language, but you have certain reserved keywords yep. which have a certain meaning. Mm -hmm. And Panini also plays with these terms, right? For instance, the very first sutra of Ashtadai is Vridhir Adej, which means Vridhi, that's that variable he's introducing. Vridhi means ad h, and h is a a i au, right? So it just gives you a flavor of how technical, how difficult to understand this traditional system is, right? These four thousand sutras, which help you to decode the entire language and to derive any possible verb form, any possible word. So this my, from these uh, verbal roots. Right, so my question was going to be, as it's obviously not a dictionary, but it, it, it basically is a system or an explanation that allows you how to construct and deconstruct words in a sense? Would that be an accurate description of... of, of yes. The Ashtadhyaya in a sense? Yes, you can say... Because it, it gives you the rules by which you can then create words from that or generators that... Yes, in a sense, he also gives a certain... Um, you can really think of it as a certain algorithms. Okay. Right? How you can... It's helpful to make these sort of connecting points because then I think people who are obviously more engaged with modern um, instances like uh, computer programming or algorithms as it becomes more and more a hot topic, yes. then they can make these connections and understand, you know, access this from a different mind state, so to speak. But yeah, exactly. So he, he gives you, for instance, certain rules. How to go from, for instance, we have the uh, verbal root bhu, mm -hmm. which means to uh, exist, to become, right? And the question is, how do you end up, for instance, the third person singular, he becomes, which is bhavati. And he gives you a certain recipe, he gives you certain sutras, how to go from that verbal root 
to go to the specific inflected verb form which you want. So there's like between Bhu and Bhavati, there are six different sutras where something is applied at the end, right? Prateya is applied. And then through certain derivations, you end up at the, at the final word, right? But he, he really, it's not, just, it's not just for that process, but he really just decodes the entire language, right? So this, this grammar is really a complete representation of the, of, the, of the rules of the language itself. How, how strictly rule-based is this and how open to, to interpretation is it in the sense that can a person take these sutras and mm -hmm. derive two different words from the same set of instructions or would it be like it's incredibly like, rigid or scientific in the sense yes. that there is one way to arrive at one word yes. and there is no deviation possible? Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, this can only happen if you un actually understand what he's saying. Which is a challenge in of itself because you could add that, that is also interpreted differently, but, but yes. Yes, but it's it's really a deterministic in a sense that there's he really leaves no leeway for interpretation or for ambiguity, and if there's and also the way he the way he gives these rules is so interesting. For instance, he will he will give a certain uh, he will make a general statement. Mm -hmm. For instance, all whatever all Vegged, all uh, plants that grow under the earth are vegetables. Let's assume, okay, for now. Okay. <laughs> Let's assume. He will give a general rule and then he will say, but tomatoes are not, not vegetables. Also, let's say carrots are not vegetables. So he will make general rules and then certain exceptions to really cover every, every single case which you see in the language because the way it actually he actually um, wrote down these sutras was by first observing the Vedas right that's you know often uh, um, often in, for instance one of the students was asking um, why why he was giving this rule it doesn't really seem to make sense right but it's to explain that which is there which are the Vedas right which in the I was going to say, let's just qualify that just for the audience, because the the assumption is that the Vedas are divinely authored yes. and ever existing, and mm -hmm. so in a sense, you have to reverse engineer exactly the Vedas. Yes, that's that's it's, that's a nice way you put it. So these sutras really decodify; they reverse engineer the Vedas. But it's an important po point because it's not the creation of a language from scratch. In a sense, it's yes. the creation of a of a framework by which you can understand the language and then further use it. Yes, from an existing let's say framework that's yes, provided exactly. through the Vedas. For instance, there were there was this attempt no, to create this language Esperanto. You've heard of yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, Actually, exactly, yeah. Actually, long right? time I hadn't heard about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I didn't follow up on it though. So maybe you know more about it than I do, but I, I did hear about it. Well, the, the idea is that I think he, um, I'm not totally aware of the details, but it's the, the concept is just the creation of a language which would be easy to speak easy to communicate in for many, um, for, for speakers of different languages, right. like Spanish, Italian, English, whatever, whatever, whatever language supposedly would, would find it easy mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. converse in that language. But that's, that's exactly the other, the other way around where Panini, he takes the Veda, he takes the Vedic revelation and he, exp he reverse engineers it. Well, in this in this uh, in this approach, you would come up with something and give your own rules to to fit your right. own design. Right, and that's that's really the difference. Yeah, it's a very different process. Um, it's interesting because you have you have you have um, people who approach this from a very very different perspective as well. Because you see how there is a faith based element even in the study of the San of Sanskrit, because somebody will say, "No, I don't believe." in the revealed scriptures or the mm -hmm. Vedas as being not man-made. And, and therefore, even the Vedas, the language of the Vedas is a created language by someone. And then you try to trace it historically and whatever else. And it would already, I assume, lead to a different way of encountering the text mm -hmm. and dealing with the text. Um, on a scale of one to 10 though, just because the way you talked about the dwindling numbers of 20 people going mm -hmm. all the way down to three, on a scale of one to 10, how hard do you think Sanskrit is to learn? 
10 being the hardest imaginable? It's a very, it's a very different, it's a very difficult question because it, it all depends how you approach it and for what purpose you're studying it. Fair point. And something I've noticed over the year or over, you know, while I was studying is I found it quite amazing how much of an understanding of the grammar itself you could have of the, of all the technical rules and the intricacies without actually being able to understand a simple sentence. <laughs> you see the point? I get that impression often from people who, who deal with Sanskrit. Even myself to an extent, like I can, I can look at a verse, sorry to interrupt you, but I can look at a verse in scripture and understand um, 80% of the words in the verse, mm -hmm. let's put it like this, just mm -hmm. through familiarity and, and repetition and still not be able to piece them together into a, an understandable sentence. Or like, mm -hmm. you, you see what I'm saying? And I'm, I'm reliant on someone else's translation to then make sense of the individual words that I understand nonetheless. Right, 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 right. So yeah, that's, that's quite, that was quite shocking for me how it, it, it really so much depends on your approach, right? So this was, this was kind of the, the traditional training I had, the traditional learning I had right? You're learning this Ashtadhyayi with, mm -hmm. with a teacher who himself had studied that mm -hmm. and was very proficient in the subject. And then eventually um, I was taking up Sanskrit courses at the university, right? And there it showed me how, how vastly different a modern approach is. A much more approachable approach with a much uh, flatter learning curve, mm -hmm. right? And to the same result? I would say a very different result, honestly, okay. right? Because for instance, if you really want to master the language, then I think you, you, you have to study these grammars, right? If it's not the original Ashtadhyayi, then different commentaries or, you know, some, some texts which are based on that uh, foundation, mm -hmm, let's say. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you want, just want to have some feeling for the language, some understanding, um, you know, being able to pick up a text and, and kind of understand roughly what is being said, then I think there are other ways to learn which are much, much easier, right. much, much more approachable. I mean, the reason I ask is because you were talking about purpose, like why are you right. studying it for? And I think mm -hmm. since it's not really a conversational language, at least in today's society, yeah. Most people who I know, at least, who want to study it, want to do it to interpret texts, yeah. right? to to mm -hmm. look at scripture and either offer up translations of it mm -hmm. or find different ways to interpret it or different meanings that are perhaps more um, hidden in the text or things of that nature. And so to that effect, I mean, by your second description of what you could learn outside of the grammar, mm -hmm. you know, setting, it would be more of a rough idea of things. And I'm, I wonder if that's really a sufficient um, understanding or education of Sanskrit to do any kind of meaningful work in that field of translation or scriptural interpretation. Because, I, don't get me wrong, I know many who do it, myself mm -hmm. included, mm -hmm. with very rough backgrounds in mm -hmm. Sanskrit or very amateur backgrounds in Sanskrit, right? Mm -hmm. But there is this constant feeling of inadequacy, at least for mine. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, okay, I can get something out of this, don't get mm -hmm. me wrong, but I can't sit here and confidently say, yes, this translation is, is true, mm -hmm. right? And I And I would feel like, any serious scholar or any mm -hmm. serious academic would want to have the feeling that beyond a shadow of a doubt, what mm -hmm. I am doing is accurate, Yeah. right? And as much as that can be had as a feeling yeah. about anything <laughs> in this world, right? But just the degree of confidence, right? Mm -hmm. That is, is as high as possible. Would it be fair to say that for that level, it is a non-negotiable to go through the, the more traditional Ashtadhyayi, for example, or something of that nature, or you think it's still achievable through a university modern format. Mm -hmm. I think one thing, I might be fudging the question a little bit. Go ahead. <laughs> but one thing, which is... It's what I do with Sanskrit texts. <laughs> which is definitely really, really important, is to understand the context in which these, this language is situated, right? Because you have a lot of scholars which might be very familiar with even the grammar itself, it's Ashtadhyayi, or uh, who have really studied Sanskrit grammar itself, but who are not familiar with the Hindu culture, with Sanatana Dharma, you know, 
And this is exactly the challenge of translation. Because, for instance, when we're in the West, or even in the globalized modern society, we have a certain view of the world, right? And these Sanskrit terms are so deeply embedded into the Vedic culture that it's very dif difficult to take them out of their context or take them out of that, you know, that worldview and offer a translation for them. That's, that's really the challenge, right? For instance, when you, uh, for instance, you have the word Atma, mm. you know? Everyone who has picked up a Bhagavad Gita is familiar with that term Atma. And but, its various uses. Right, but what does it mean? Yeah. You know? So when we, for instance, when we, uh, when we translate Atma as soul, does that t English term or whatever uh, other non-Sanskrit term, yeah. does it really do justice to the actual word atma right for instance there's a verse in in the gita chapter 6 where krishna says udhared atman atmanam so one should raise the atma by the atma yeah one should not let the atma you know lower itself or degrade itself and it's often translated as one should raise the mind by the mind exactly yeah right but literally it says uh, the atma is the mm -hmm. friend of the atma mm -hmm. and the atma is the enemy of the atma so so what what is the meaning of the word, right? This is really the difficulty. Would the argument be that one would know the meaning by practicing the principle and then understanding how the the statement relates to the practice or the experience? Because I, let me give you an example, mm -hmm. just from the English side of things. Like we're having words in English that obviously have double meanings: mm -hmm. orange, to mm -hmm. color, and a fruit. Yeah. Right. And so if you read in a text somewhere, mm -hmm. oh, and then the boy proclaimed orange you as the translator of that or you as, as, as the interpreter of that rather mm -hmm. would have to make a, a judgment call mm -hmm. is he proclaiming the color that he has seen it somewhere or the fruit exactly. right and so if you don't um live in the the place in which that proclamation was made mm -hmm. then that already makes it more difficult to know whether it was accurate or not let's tell and i imagine i tell you that the boy lives in the north pole Mm -hmm. yeah. chances that it's the fruit become extremely limited for example probably he was pointing at orange in the sky from the sunset for example mm -hmm. right different ways like that and mm -hmm. so the lived experience or the contextual experience or the or the realizations to put it even on another domain that can come from executing the path hinduism sanatan mm -hmm. dharma mm -hmm. can often then reveal the intended meaning because intention matters Right, mm -hmm. So as the text was being written, what was the intention, first of all, because that already starts to inform why certain words could potentially be being used. But then the, the physical experience, the direct perception, in my estimation, again, naturally lends to one interpretation over another. And I can easily understand how an academic or a scholar that has no actual practice or understanding of the context in which these things are said mm -hmm. or done or whatever, could not possibly arrive at the right meaning. Right. I mean, often, exactly, uh, scholars from outside of the tradition would take these texts out of their context and then give their own meaning. While these texts themselves say, you have to study them by cultivating the mindset which they're trying to give you. you mm -hmm. Ideally, you would study them from a guru, right? And then the real meaning will be revealed, right? Because that's the whole purpose of these, of, in general, of Shastra, you know, to give you something, to give you a message, how to transform yourself and how to elevate yourself to your to ultimately realize your divine self and God himself, no? Absolutely right. I once characterized this, because um, someone was asking me about this before, like what is the real need to learn this stuff from mm -hmm. a guru, right? And I said, imagine you, you have a cookbook in your hand full of recipes, but mm -hmm. you've never stepped foot in a kitchen. You've never seen ingredients, right? right? You, who would you need to, to to identify the statements there? Knife, cheese, whatever. Like you need a chef who goes there and says, "This is a knife. That's the cheese. This is how they interact together to produce slices of cheese." Yeah. Right. And they piece everything together because they have prior knowledge of it. Yeah. And the guru is the same in the sense that you have statements like, "Oh, meditate on the self and experience bliss." Mm. 
how can somebody tell you this unless they know what the self is, they know what bliss is, they know what meditation is. So it's like the statements that are there as instructions have to have been experienced because they're pointing towards experiences. Mm. The statements in incur verbs, actions that are done to reach certain experiences or cognitions. And so you need someone who is cognizant of those things or has experienced those things in order to correctly identify what is being said. Otherwise, it's like it reminds me of um, The Little Mermaid. I don't know if you ever watched The Little Mermaid. But in The Little Mermaid, there was the, the seagull who used to come and interact with Ariel and and he would bring objects from the human world and Ariel was a mermaid living under the water mm -hmm. and didn't know about the human world. And so, for example, one time I think she got a fork and he was saying it was a, a hairbrush because he didn't know what it was really about because he never lived in a in a setting where a fork is used for eating. He had never seen that. So she takes it and she starts brushing her hair with the fork, right? And I always laughed at that and think that that's exactly why you need a guru because you take an instruction or you take an object and you misuse it or you don't understand its actual intended meaning yeah. or intended purpose yeah. because the person who is instructing you, be it yourself or a third party, isn't actually qualified or doesn't actually know. Mm, yeah. Exactly. Silly example, but I think it transmits the point. Yeah, quite, quite it illustrates clearly. the point well. And that, that question, you know, how much you have to be familiar with, um, let's say, the original grammars it's really about this concept, uh, this context and this mindset being embedded in this uh, consciousness of Sanatan Dharma from which these texts come. And then this meaning is, is more available, right? I wouldn't say it's so much about whether you study the traditional way or a modern way, <laughs> but it's much more really living, living that, you know? And then the meaning will come, the hidden meaning will come yeah but, but before we we go into hidden meanings because i do want to unpack that um because i think there's this great depth to be found in that but also some pitfalls um translation work we were mm -hmm. talking about translation before yeah. and some of the challenges that the academics face versus mm -hmm. someone who's in, like, embedded in the tradition mm -hmm. we've done some translation work mm -hmm. i mean you've you've done that more recently um for bhakti marga for mm -hmm. guruji for our you know, our uh, texts and the commentaries that Guruji gives. From your end, I mean, I can compliment from my side, but speak to maybe some of the challenges or, or particularities of the act of translating Sanskrit as you as you do it from a greater, you know, wealth of understanding. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it more from the perspective of, I take existing translations, I take my very basic understanding of the words and I'm trying to actually stay true to the Siddhanta that I already know from Guruji. Mm -hmm. So Guruji my, being my lens, mm -hmm. my, I would say, quite accurate or rich understanding of Guruji's mm -hmm. teachings as my active lens to extract a meaning that would be as um, compatible as possible without betraying the text yeah. to what he mm -hmm. is teaching. And of course, there's a bias in that. And the bias mm -hmm. is that I want that the commentary he's about to give to be as complemented by the text and not make a jarring, conflicting experience right. as much as possible. Mm -hmm. But of course, as I was saying earlier, because of my lack of skills in Sanskrit, there is a feeling there sometimes of, am I twisting the text too much mm -hmm. to suit my my implicit bias, mm -hmm. right? And I don't want to do that, right? Yeah. But that, that's a challenge mm -hmm. in that. And I feel like as I myself have studied the landscape of, of Shastra and Vaishnavism, whatever else, I encounter so many people seemingly doing that mm -hmm. um, because how is it possible that you get one text like the Bhagavad Gita, mm -hmm. which is not vast. Mm -hmm. We're talking 700 slash 701 verses, mm -hmm. depending on the version and go to any mission, any temple, any whatever it may be, editor mm -hmm. and the Sanskrit translations are different. Yeah, Sometimes very different, yeah. right? Um, so I, I hand over to you. How do you view that process almost from start to finish? How, how do you approach something like that from your background? I mean, you already made uh, some, some points which I definitely agree with, right? It's always a balance between being true to the original text itself and the intention with which that author composed that text, wrote down that text. And for instance, when we're doing translation for work for Bhakti Marga mm -hmm. with our Siddhanta, Guruji's view, right? So this is, this is definitely a challenge, but the, the beauty of Sanskrit is such that in certain cases, it really allows for a lot of ambiguity, 
right? The way you can split up certain words, the different meanings, which a vast amount of meaning, which a particular word can have depending on the context, right? This is really what allows to to um, find a good sweet spot between between being loyal to the original text and and presenting it it in such a way that is somehow flavored by your own own missions, Siddhanta. Explain to me or to the audience how that isn't a contradiction to the previous idea that there is no ambiguity in the creation of these words according to the Ashtadihai like the, there's a rule of how mm -hmm. the words are made and how you, what are you doing there when you split a word let's mm -hmm. say to to derive let's say a slightly different meaning or something mm -hmm. like that that doesn't break those rules in a sense how do how do those two things coexist yes these things coexist because it's it's embedded in the language that there is an Im ambiguity in the sense so the way you would break the word is also a rule if that makes sense, is that correct? Like, yes, there's a certain way to to so in 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 Sanskrit you have this uh, concept of sandhi, mm -hmm. right? Which means when um, suppose you have two words next to one another, and if you take that one word in isolation, the ending is different than when you have a particular word which follows it. Right? Yeah. For instance, you have the word guru, mm -hmm. which by itself is just guru, but if you have guru and deva then it becomes so for instance guru uh, guru brahma guru vishnu guru deva maheshwara gurur brahma gurur vishnu right so we have this r sound there because of the the next word yeah right and so um when you split so these um, through this process of sandhi words can also merge right and also, yeah. especially in compounds, you um, compounds are basically multiple words forming one unit. And the way you can split that there is inherently ambiguous in the language because multiple, let's say multiple combi combinations can lead to the same result. It's, to give you an example from which might be more relatable, for instance, when I give you the, the number six, is that two plus four or four plus two or three plus three or one plus one plus one plus one, you yeah, know? Yeah. But that doesn't violate the rules of mathematics. Correct. No? The rules of mathematics are cl crystal clear. The rules of Sanskrit grammar are cl crystal clear, but still there is inherently this ambiguity. No, it makes sense. I mean, but to give an example now, how these translations are impactful, they meet, they matter in philosophical terms or even in, in theological terms is that, I've seen linguistic arguments for the existence of sort of different philosophical conclusions. So to take something like Tattva mm -hmm. as a Mahavakya from the mm -hmm. Upanishads. I can't remember, maybe a couple of years ago, I encountered a, a linguistic argument for like a Vaishnava refutation of that or, or non-Advaitic refutation of mm -hmm. it. Because Tattva is often used as, as fuel for Advaitic conclusions, so, right? You are that. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that it was actually, if you, if you take the word prior to Tat in the Tattva Masi, mm -hmm. as it is found in the Upanishads, that the A can either be attached to the end of the previous word or the beginning of Tat to be At Tattva Masi. You are not that, right? As a negation of Tat in a sense, right? It gives quite a different meaning, no? And they say, there, therefore there, that's it. That's the entire refutation of uh -huh. Advaita. They're not even bothering to go into <laughs> any other refutation. It's just, you see, I have linguistically proven to mm -hmm. you the misinterpretation of that Mahavakya. Mm -hmm. Right now, I'm not trying to argue that that is the refutation. End of story. Mm -hmm. But just trying to illustrate how uh, these linguistics and these interpretive rules and and, and different ways that you can um, look at that text without breaking the rules of, of Sanskrit grammar can produce very impactful differences in interpretation and meaning. And I would suggest, and I want to hear what you think about that, that that might be at the very least a contributing factor as to the existence of so many different Vedantas. Now, mm. obviously, yeah. the actual different cognitions of the various Acharyas, mm -hmm. the different realizations and bhavas and whatever else that the different mm. Acharyas had are the primary, I would say, factor that mm -hmm. leads to the di their differentiation. There are those who would even argue that the root of all knowledge, Bhagavan, mm -hmm. is the primary factor, that he actually purposely 
sends different knowledge to different people uh-huh. to create uh, varied approaches that suit different people's, let's say, natures, for example. Mm-hmm. There are so many reasons that one can list as to why there are a variety of, mm-hmm. of um, how can I put it, uh, Vedantas, right? But the, the reason I want to pick out this language one particularly is mm-hmm. the one that seems most human to me or most humanly malleable. Because the realizations of acharyas is, is something that you cannot touch, you cannot yeah. affect in a sense. Mm-hmm. It is what it is and you, you either believe in it or you don't. It either resonates with you or it doesn't. Uh, the, the, the machinations of God sending things down is something that irrespective of your opinion of it, it's happened or it hasn't happened, right? These things are in a sense irrelevant. Mm-hmm. But when it comes down to linguistics and when we're looking at that and in using like molding the Sanskrit to produce outcomes, yeah. that seems like a very human uh process or a very mm-hmm. uh, or at least a process that humans can affect to a great degree what are your thoughts on on therefore like how much language and interpretation of language can affect the production or negation of philosophy in a sense mm-hmm. like oh it can definitely play a big role i agree totally that the ones you know the acharya's own realizations are the primary um differentiator for these different philosophies different siddhantas different forms of vedanta but Sanskrit just gives them a tool and also the interpretation techniques which are used to interpret these texts give you such a wide tool to lay down the text, the meaning of the text in such a way that it seems to be fully in line with the text itself but also seems to be in line with your own, with that Acharya's own mm-hmm. view and that, that own you know, that own personal sedanta. I think the concern that arises in others, and certainly in myself, is that there, there, there is a suspicion of manipulation mm-hmm. going on there. So mm-hmm. for example, if you take a text and you, you take its primary meaning, its literal meaning, mm-hmm. and you go, that doesn't fully match what I've experienced. Mm-hmm. Let's put yourself in the shoes of an acharya. You're an yeah. acharya, right? Mm-hmm. You've had some, some anubhava of sorts. Mm-hmm. And you look at this and you go, well, it doesn't match uh, as overtly as I would like it to. Right. right. I will not accuse the Acharya of doing anything tricky in mm-hmm. a sense, but there is a suspicion of some trick being played here because it's going to say, well, but actually, if I just, you know, twist this word a little here and that one a little there without breaking any rules, I'm not, mm-hmm. you know, accusing them of, of fully nefarious activities, but let's just do that, that, and that. Now I could derive this meaning and that meaning and suddenly it, it, it matches what I've realized, right? Yeah. There you go. Is that manipulation or is that just a valid, fully permissible process mm-hmm. that the Shastra or the, the Sanskrit grammarians, in a sense, have mm-hmm. presented as being fully viable and there's nothing dishonest about yeah. that process? Um, in my personal view, it's really there's really nothing dishonest about it. For instance, when we go back to that Mahavakyam Tatvamasi, right? You mentioned this this certain mm-hmm. uh, play with to potential negate, yeah. Sandhi, which actually means, uh, you know, where the literal meaning would actually be, you are not that. Right. But let's say, I mean, for instance, Ramanuja, mm-hmm. he took it as that, as the as the tatwamasi, as yes. that that he took it, he accepted as the primary meaning, right? But you have these different layers of word meanings, right? In Sanskrit, the primary meaning would be called mukya vritti. Mm-hmm. For instance, when you hear the word cow. Right, the first image that comes to your mind is this animal with the horns and the four legs. Right, mine didn't have horns. The one that came into my mind. Yeah, and unfortunately <laughs> nowadays no more <laughs> horns. But in India, let's say sure, most sure, of them sure, wouldn't sure. have a horn. <laughs> so that is the mukya vritti, the 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 obvious literal meaning, right? And but in instances where the first the primary meaning doesn't make sense, you have to resort to the secondary meaning, which would be called Lakshana Vritti. For instance, to give you an example in in English even, if you're in a different city and you ask, where's that Indian restaurant? And someone tells you, oh, it's on Church Street. Right? It doesn't mean that it's on the street, but that would actually be the literal meaning. It's on the street, like this glass is on the table, but obviously the restaurant is not on the street. It's beside it. Right, but we're so used to that expression that obviously 
it's beside. We have our interpretive lens of that statement, right? Immediately, so. this primary meaning doesn't even come to our mind. Yeah. Right? And it's the same, for instance, with that statement, how the Vaishnava Acharyas were interpreting this Mahavakya, for instance, that the literal meaning, this Mukya Vritti, would not make sense. Tatvamasi, you are that Brahman. So they they took the secondary meaning that you are that Brahman because in, in quality, there's a qualitative difference, but doesn't mean that you are God, but you share the nature of God, right? And, you know, since we we follow, um, you know, also this this view, this yes. uh, Siddhanta, yeah. you know, that we are not, we're not God in fullness, but yeah. we share his qualities. Yeah. Um, I would definitely agree that that is actually true to the text and the intent um, behind that statement. Because, I mean, in, in my view, the, mm -hmm. the real meaning of as any statement has to match the intended meaning of the author, you know? Taking taking that aside, as as let's say that, that we have no insight into the intended meaning of the author of the Upanishads, let's sure. just let's just say there is a way in which both can be um, justifiable, if not true, at the same time. Mm -hmm. But let's suggest that the Advaitic position would be that they take that initial proposition that you are Brahman, mm -hmm. and instead of dismissing that as being illogical, because to the, our apparent conception of self, it very clearly does not point towards us being Brahman, right? Which I understand, therefore Ramanuja. Or with the Vashishta Advaita and looking at that and saying, mm, can't be the first meaning, can't mm. be the primary meaning, let's go to a secondary meaning. Mm -hmm. I understand that process. I would equally say that there is merit to the Advaita in saying, it doesn't appear to be so at first, but before I dismiss it as being illogical, let us try to contend with it and see if there is any way in which this can be reconciled through experience, mm -hmm. for example, right? Mm -hmm. And then Advaitic realizations, so to speak, for whatever value they have or don't have, I'm you know, not going to pass judgment on that, would then lead to a, a reaffirmation of that statement as being possible, right? Mm. So it's not that they're making unfounded claims that are just easily dismissed by, uh, well, that's illogical. Advaita refuted, right? right? It's that type of thing where it starts to explain why so many different philosophical conceptions justifiably coexist in mm -hmm. a sense whether you agree with it is something entirely different to it being justifiable or not right right now again that's just on one mahavakya mm -hmm. you would have to take the entire corpus of what you consider to be authentic vedic literature and then perform the same process i would assume right um but let's maybe hone in on one specific um text where i think this sort of uh, principle of mm. primary and secondary even tertiary meaning um, or indicative meaning can can start to to play a bigger role, and it's and I think that's in Puranic literature, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Story based literature, right? So for us as Vaishnavas, Vishnu Purana, Shrimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Purana are predominant, and we are encouraged to 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 study them, to mm -hmm. familiarize ourselves with the stories, and then the question arises often: to what end? Mm -hmm. Familiarize with the story for what purpose? Mm -hmm. Um, I'd allow you to comment on this first before I start rambling on my own realizations <laughs> on that. But I'm curious to hear what, what your uh, take on that is from mm -hmm. this Sanskrit perspective. Yes. So. Um, if we look at the, the Bhagavatam, which you mentioned, it's part of the Puranic corpus, right? It's one of the Puranas, but its language is actually quite a bit different compared to the other Puranas. The, Purana, the Puranic Sanskrit in general is usually not too difficult it's not it's m m rather straightforward in most what would you attribute that to just incidentally because the, um given the context in in which these were these were uh spoken mm -hmm. right these puran because at, at you know in vedic times not everyone could study the vedas right or the upanishads but the puranas were there to give that same teaching of divinity to, you know, everyone else who was not eligible at that time to study the Vedas. And then it was transmitted through an oral tradition. It, through an oral tradition, mostly it was passed on, yeah. right? But if we look at the Sanskrit of the Bhagavatam, it's much more refined. It's very, very poetic. It's very sophisticated. Yeah. And 
the whole the whole question is why why is it written in the way it's written why does it contain stories what is the purpose of these stories mm -hmm. right and the whole purpose in my view mm -hmm. of the bhagavatam is to give the philosophy of bhakti is to show the process of bhakti devotion to the supreme lord devotion to Srimanarayan through stories, right? But often it happens that people get caught up in these stories, whereas the story was only there to convey primarily a message. Now this doesn't dismiss the fact or the b strong belief which we Vaishnavas have, for instance, that Krishna Leela was happening. No, Krishna was here on earth. He performed his Leela. Mm -hmm. He was even lifting Govardhan and such. You know, it's not about dismissing those, um, the faith or shattering anyone's faith. But in my view, the intention of the Bhagavatam is not to tell the stories for the sake of the stories, right? But for you to immerse yourself in that devotion which is being conveyed through these narrations and through this text. Yeah, I think, I think the biggest mistake people do is they, they think it's an either or situation. Yeah. It's either symbolic or it's literal. Yeah. And I think, it, why why can it not be both? Right. Yeah. And I, I unpack that also in one of my other videos I've done on my channel. Um, but essentially what I, what I unpacked it to is that reality is composed of various types of truths. Mm -hmm. Truth doesn't equate to reality. Mm -hmm. Truth is an aspect of reality and that truth exists in different facets. And if you take a fictional character, fiction can be true. Fiction in some sense can be truer than the literal world mm -hmm. and the way i mean that is that imagine you take um the life of one individual and you literally map it out and you literally track the activities of that individual on a day-to-day -day mm -hmm. basis and then you make that into a book mm -hmm. and say that is the human experience mm -hmm. and then you take another book when you create a fictional character mm -hmm. that is the sum total of the experiences of a hundred people and lives out the highs and the lows and the, the principles of a hundred people and then you map out the life of that fictional character and then you say that is human existence mm -hmm. which one of them do you think will be the more compelling let's say testimony of human well, existence probably the latter the fiction yeah because it's encompassing a a wider range of of humans the mm -hmm. category that you are trying to to explain and the category that you're trying to in a sense mm -hmm. map out in a way that the one single person could never do mm -hmm. right and so just on that very basic example you understand how something fictional can hold more value mm -hmm. more truth value yeah. in a sense can be more true than any single person could ever be hoped to be true yeah because how could you embody a hundred people in in yourself you right. know what i mean not so easy mm -hmm. right but a text can a fictional character mm -hmm. can and i i have seen people say something like oh radharani she is the embodiment of everyone's bhakti mm -hmm. to the point where it's almost suggesting that she's a fictional character and somebody will look at that and say that's highly offensive and i say well to you mm -hmm. like i'm not saying she's not mm -hmm. real of course i believe she's real but if i was to adopt the mindset that she is uh, a symbolic embodiment of all the bhakti that is real mm -hmm. of all the very real devotees of the lord mm -hmm. i still wouldn't be comfortable saying the word therefore she's not real i would say well then radha is still real in mm -hmm. just in a different understanding of the word real yeah and perhaps even more real Mm. than the individual embodied conception of her could ever be right it's it's just different ways of encountering the same thing yeah. and i think that there, it's a level of sophistication mm -hmm. that most uh most people who encounter scripture don't even begin to think of mm -hmm. and they really see it as black and white mm -hmm. and that's also i feel like why for instance the bhagavatam especially has mostly been dismissed by western scholars sentimentalism right uh, mythology you know yeah. we hear this word a lot where mythology so it's based on a myth right it's myth is something which is fictional and people just tell to have uh, nice bedtime stories or whatever mm -hmm. and they don't see the depth necessarily which which these texts hold for instance go, go ahead go ahead, finish your for thought. instance when we look at the leela of gajendra right gajendra yeah. moksha the point is not to discuss where that elephant lived or how that or when that incident happened, you know? or how a crocodile can how keep croc its bite on the leg of an elephant for as long as he did. Exactly. <laughs> or how this, uh, how this crocodile can utter Sanskrit prayers, you no, know? written in a certain verse format, you no. Know? 
This is not the point, but the point is to show you how powerful is the surrender to God. No? And this is the whole point it's trying to evoke in us when we deeply contemplate on these leelas. Mm -hmm. right? But it's not about, for instance, there's an example given, for instance, when um, kids learn the English alphabet, for instance. A is the first letter, so often uh, they would be presented with an apple because apple starts with A, mm -hmm. right? But the apple is only there to show you the A. But then people start asking questions and go into a debate. Was that apple green? Was it red? Was it sweet? Was it sour? No, the apple, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that there was no apple, that the apple doesn't exist. But the whole point is to show you A. Yeah. And likewise, these leelas of the Bhagavatam, they're there to show us how is bhakti lived? How is it expressed? How can you dive into it? I mean, I fully agree. And I think one of the... I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this topic because, of course, as a as any serious spiritual practitioner that deals with these literatures, you have to, at some point, mm -hmm. encounter that thought of how do I... Um, rationalize this how do i interpret it how do i extract as much meaning out mm -hmm. of this as possible as well mm -hmm. right not just the trivial questions of is it really true or not no how true is it like, to what depth can i really mm -hmm. you know to go into this and one of the things that i that i've observed in dealing with this is that the tendency to reduce it to mythology is widespread and, and I think gaining momentum, unfortunately. And you take someone like Dev Dut Patanaik, who is incredibly popular as an author in India, and you see, you go to Indian airports and you see his books regularly in top 10 sellers and all this kind of thing. And he's he, he reduces it to mythology. Mm -hmm. But in doing so, he does even a second error that I think is, is um, unfortunately a byproduct of reducing it to mythology in the first place, which is if it's mythology and therefore not ultimately real, mm -hmm. it's also customizable. Mm -hmm. you can change the mythology to right. add another symbolism or to mm -hmm. convey a different meaning that you think should be conveyed. Mm -hmm. um, because if it's mythology, there's not really a Krishna mm -hmm. that spoke these words. Right. It's the fictional Krishna that is trying to transmit a meaning. And so the question is who created the fictional Krishna yeah. was just a wise man trying to transmit mm -hmm. meaning. And so Devdut Bhattanaik, as a wise man, can transmit meaning to you through the creation of fictional characters, mm -hmm. right? Through mythology. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a is a grave mistake because mm -hmm. even if we are attributing symbolic meaning to these texts and stories, mm -hmm. even if we're saying, yes, there's plenty of room for interpretation and, and to extract these kind of things, my faith or the literal meaning, because I'm saying it's not either or, right? We're combining the two. So mm -hmm. my literal meaning also tells me that these scriptures were compiled by God, mm -hmm. Veda Vyas, like literally, this is something I find fascinating about Sanatana Dharma, that the scriptures, the, the story-based scriptures, the Puranic mm -hmm. literatures, were handpicked and selected and compiled by a literary incarnation of the Lord, mm -hmm. that, that he cares so much about what message is being delivered, to right. what effect, that he doesn't leave that in the hands of wise men. He's like, I'll personally come and curate the stories. Mm -hmm. You know, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, and even the fact that you said that the Bhagavatam is uh, more poetic and more mm -hmm. pristine in some sense, I've always attributed that to the fact of the purpose of the Bhagavatam, that, mm -hmm. that the purpose is, in the, at least in, as, as the narrative of the Bhagavatam tells us itself, the Veda Vyas is confronted by dissatisfaction, by, by incompletion to his own life activity. Mm -hmm. And even if that was a literal dissatisfaction, again, what is the symbolic dissatisfaction of exactly. that? And that is that you can be as proficient and competent as you want. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have love, if you don't talk about the highest principle, the highest raison d'etre, mm -hmm. what are you doing? There's mm -hmm. still a, a gaping hole in your life, yeah. right? And so to fulfill that, to, to then expose that and express that as he did, it is the pinnacle it is mm. the peak, it is the, the best. And so clearly the best Sanskrit is there, the most yeah. poetic and beautiful and whatever else, emotive, right? Yeah. So all of that confirms a literal and it marries it to a, to a symbolic to produce what I would call reality, mm. not truth. A reality composed, composed of various forms of truth, if that makes sense. Mm. And if people could grasp that, mm. and, I, and I don't underplay it, I really think that this is like, this is the key in a sense to marrying mm -hmm. the Hindu mind that 
feels itself gravitating towards empirical truths and and struggling to understand the the ancient traditions and practices of what looks like a stone age mm. tradition or stone age mythology yeah. to someone who doesn't understand how they can rationally explain its truth but feel in their heart such love for krishna that they can't listen to the word mythology that hurts their heart mm. right and so these two people like the, the one who believes so much in the literal truths of it feels them almost but can't rationalize it can't rationally explain what's going on in mm. these stories and then the one who's so literal and so empirical but you know almost regrettably can't believe in them he wants to because mm. he's you know, he, he, it's his culture and he thinks that there's value in it. He sees that person and the, the joy that that person is experiencing says, I want to taste that, but I'm not willing to sacrifice my rationality to do so. Yeah. And I and I respect both positions. The person who, who trusts their feelings, even though they can't rationally or eloquently explain them. Mm. And the person who doesn't want to abandon their rationality to accept something that they otherwise would want to. Mm. And I feel like the, the middle, the reconciliary tool here is this it's mm. understanding how to marry the symbolic with the literal mm. and it comes from these primary secondary potentially as i said tertiary interpretations of the text and how that that is not a manipulation or a magic trick exactly that is being performed but it's actually embedded into it which then makes you think if it is embedded into it then it's not only something that is available to you but perhaps intended exactly that you are intended to find multiple layers of meaning into yeah. it now i will caveat all of this which is there is a parallel to this process uh -huh. in the real world, mm -hmm. right? Which is as a Swami, I'm often approached by people who want to help, want my help in them interpreting uh, behaviors, actions, or instructions from Guruji. Mm. So they'll come to me and say, Guruji said this or did mm. this, and I'm struggling to understand. Yeah. Can you help me? Mm. And I'm confronted with the same dilemma. Mm -hmm. primary, secondary, tertiary interpretations of what he has done or said. And I've always um, taken the position that I would rather fail mm. by following and, and listening to the literal, mm -hmm. meaning the primary meaning, than to engage my fantasy and imagination mm. too deeply in finding secondary, tertiary, mm. fourth, fifth, sixth level meanings, yeah. right? Because they suit me mm. better. Mm. And there you feel, and this is what I what I want to hear from you, what your take on is, is this inner, I don't want to call it a compulsion, but this this sneakiness, this this feeling of this mm. this almost unnoticeable, like it's so subtle. The minute you open yourself up to the possibility of a secondary meaning, mm. which we have just done, we've just blown mm. the door open to that, right? It can bite you. Yeah. in your bottom mm. very much no, to the point no. of of you can have the guru standing in front of you saying something to mm. you desperately trying to get you to follow what he's saying and all you're doing is applying secondary and tertiary meanings to what exactly. he's saying yeah oh he's shouting me but really he's shouting at my ego because he loves me so much and therefore you just sit in front of him smiling and in bath while he's shouting at you but really he wants you to understand that you're doing something terribly wrong mm. right how to mitigate something like that yeah and I find it to be a very double-edged sword. Mm. I mean, what are your thoughts? That's also. I mean, it's it's great that you brought up this caveat. Totally justified, because you know, on one hand, we're dealing with shastra, and shastra has you can say it, it has its own language. It has its own way to be understood. There are certain primary meanings, secondary meanings, intended meanings, and so forth. That is shastra. That is shastra, which is static. It's in place, but the living Sadhguru, you cannot re apply any rules to him, right? For instance, in Mimamsa, you have certain rules how to interpret statements of the Vedas, right? When you do a sacrifice, how to understand what you actually have to do. But whenever you would try to apply a certain framework of understanding the Sadhguru, he would totally destroy that. It's not possible with him. Right, And so there it takes a lot of groundedness, it takes a lot of maturity to not go into your fantasy because who wants to, because when the Sadhguru gives a clear instruction, who is it that wants to twist the meaning somehow? It's always our ego, which is which can be so subtle, right, that we we don't hear it. We hear the words, 
But somehow we're so blinded by our own delusion, by our own fantasy, by our own ego, that we don't get it. Mm-hmm. And this is the, this is somehow, yeah, this is, this is, this is quite amazing how we can be blinded by our own ego, by our own ignorance, and not hear the obvious message he's trying to tell us. And that's, I think, the risk element. I think there is, it would be, for me at least, I find it wrong to to propose all of this without saying, as beautiful as this endeavor of finding primary, secondary meanings, mm. etc., and really contending with both the symbolic and the literal, mm-hmm. as beautiful and rich and profound as that is, there is always a risk element that fantasy takes over. Mm. Fantasy fed by your ego, by by convenience, right? That it does take over. But there's something I wanted to point out, a parallel that I think is interesting based on what you said today. You explained to me that the way you can break down the words mm-hmm. to, to, and therefore this ambiguity that's embedded in the system right. is stated by the rules. So the rules allow for ambiguity mm-hmm. within a rules framework in a sense, yes. right? And I think the guru's non-conformance to rules is also stated in the same way, in mm-hmm. the sense that scripture, and I've said this before in previous um, conversations, but scripture describes certain beings mm-hmm. such as Paramahamsa's elevated sannyasis as knowing rules but not conforming to them and so the rule book scripture just like the 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 grammar books are in a sense the rule book mm-hmm. for sanskrit there's right. the rule book for for understanding tattvas and for understanding conduct and mm-hmm. different things such as is shastra it speaks of of these beings and says they know and yet they don't conform. Mm. And so it's like when you look at Guruji, the accusation could be the same as I made against the interpreter of scripture, which is, isn't there an element of manipulation there and convenience that, mm-hmm. oh, isn't it convenient that I can just break that word to now suit my needs, mm-hmm. right? And you, and the, the answer we came to was that, no, it's not manipulation. It's actually an embedded permissible uh, fact of the, the language, right? Mm-hmm. So similarly, it's an embedded permissible fact of the state of being, of the realization of such a being that permits them to not conform to the otherwise stated rules of conduct. Mm. Because somebody will say, and this is the most common accusation in the entire landscape of religion, why don't you practice what you preach? Mm. That's how we know that this person is is fake, bogus, right? They preach one thing, they don't practice it. And it's like, well, who are they preaching to and who are they? So if, as Krishna says in 434 that those who have seen the truth Mm -hmm. can then instruct you why do you need instruction because you have not seen the truth so two categories of beings are established Mm. one who has seen the truth one who has not and if we take seen to be not just perceived but realized so it's a more essential state of being rather than an informational data let's put it like this driven understanding so we have these two distinct categories of being you could say well this one is instructing this one how to become this one. Why should he then behave like this one? Exactly. Yeah. Mm. So it precisely would require the one doing the talking to not do the walking mm. in the sense. Because if he starts to behave like the sick person to show the sick person how to become healthy, there's something a little wrong or twisted about this. It's like the sick person looks at the healthy one who's giving you the instructions. Would you go to a doctor and the doctor's telling you how to become healthy, but the doctor is as sick as you? Would you have immense confidence in that person? No. And yet we apply the same logic in Mm -hmm. a twisted way onto the spiritual master where you say, you impose these rules on me and yet you don't conform to the rules yourself. Therefore, you're bogus. And the point is, is that here is a transcended, realized, liberated person dealing with a fully conditioned person that requires this framework of rules to get them out of the jungle of Maya in a sense right mm. to live like that being to into the state of being of that master right and i think it's just um it's a point people miss mm. and yet it's i hope that as i've presented it now it becomes a clearer way of rationalizing and understanding logically it makes sense that the being is not walking the talk in some instances you know, as and when it, he deems it appropriate not to, in a sense, because of the different categories of beings that we're dealing with, and that is established by the rule book. These are not convenient fabrications mm. that we're producing just because, well, it would excuse away a lot of irregular behaviors or whatever. No, it's mm. actually there. Yeah. Right. So it, I just found that parallel with what you were describing mm. to me about the rules of Sanskrit, in a sense. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the deeper you dive into that knowledge, how to understand things, 
how to view things, for instance, through language, even that Shastra has a certain way of language, of presenting things, then it becomes more and more clear that it's not that it's not about twisting things it's not about fudging things but it's actually taking the meaning as it's intended which which might seem hmm. fabricated but it's actually how for instance a divine personality like that is you no know? beyond this rule book right but people who are too stuck to the rule book will often with an immature understanding go into a lot of judgment mm -hmm. right but this judgment doesn't come from a place of realization of true wisdom but of superficial understanding i'll give you a really good example of that because i fully agree with what you just said just as we interpret the text and we have to know the lens of what was intended by the one who authored the text mm -hmm. same thing when we're interpreting the behavior of a person mm -hmm. so somebody behaves a certain way and you judge it mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be Guruji right now, but just anyone, right? Mm -hmm. And then you ask them, why did you behave that way? And then they state their intention and suddenly your cognition or perception or your judgment of that act may change yeah. because it qualifies the behavior completely and you see it from a different lens and you're like, oh, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Actually, good behavior, fruitful, mm -hmm. justifiable. Mm -hmm. right? And I'll take the example of Guruji. He was, um, he came down one time for an event and he was dressed, you know, like he had a lot of jewelry on. He had jewelry everywhere. And like he really exaggerated. And uh, and I looked at it and I smiled, you know, like I I, I was accustomed to this kind of behavior and, and I was, uh, I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I just enjoyed it. But as I saw him, I have the tendency to be, I'm quite observant. And so I like to watch people and mm -hmm. um, I'm quite perceptive. And so I see the reactions of people, this kind of stuff. And so I, he gets in his chair, he starts to talk and I'm, and I'm seeing certain people and I'm seeing their expressions, I'm seeing their reactions and I'm assuming um, they're finding this weird. Like, why does he have that? Why does he do that? You why know? does he need it? Right. All these kind of questions coming up. And then I, I, sure enough, was approached by a couple of people in two separate conversations that evening after the satsang or after the event. I can't remember if it was a satsang or an event. They came up to me and they're like, you know, Swami, we have a question. Why does he do that? Mm. It just, it, it's so jarring for my mind because he's supposedly a transcendent spiritual being who has no need for anything material. And yet it seems like he's attached to his physical beauty. He wants to accentuate his physical beauty. But there's also like... Um, cost associated with these things like these things appear to be expensive of course you never know because you can always be fake jewelry but it appears to be expensive and if so that seems like a a rather controversial or inappropriate use of funds you know like this kind of thing and i said have you ever asked him why he does it as a as an answer to the person and they said well no like they just they didn't even cross their mind they were like and then they were like but I guess since I can't, maybe I'm asking you because maybe you have, right? And I was like, fair point, I have. Mm -hmm. I have asked him in the past why he does that. And I said, but I don't want to tell you. Why don't you go tomorrow to satsang and ask the question? Raise your hand and ask it. And they were like, do you think it's okay? And I was like, if you do it respectfully, sure. Like, don't accuse him of anything. Mm -hmm. Like, that's not obviously the way you talk to anyone. But if you say, you know, I've noticed this and I'm, I'm genuinely curious mm -hmm. why you do it. Maybe he'll answer you. And if he doesn't, you can come back to me. Mm -hmm. right? But I want you I want you to try it yourself first. right? And the person sort of mustered up the courage and said, okay, Lion, let's do it. Next day, they put their hand up and Guruji said, what's your question? And the person asked. And Guruji, he said, to shock you. <laughs> and the person was like, what do you mean? He's like, I, am, I do this to provoke your mind and to, to bring the judgment out to the forefront. Mm -hmm. And then as your judgment is there and you're swimming in your criticism and in your judgment, it will start to, to lose its power because the reason why you're really here will also come up because you feel something, because you like what I'm saying, because you understand that there's something more profound going on here. And so the fact that your judgment comes as a, as a provoked reaction, and then yet this deeper, more meaningful reaction follows, right? What, what that does to you is that it makes you less superficial because you start to understand that deeper, profound things often lie beneath the surface mm. or beneath the point of judgment. And so I do this 
because I know in some sense I have already captivated your hearts and in some sense you've already given me your trust mm -hmm. because of our relationship. And so I'm able to provoke these latent tendencies inside of you. I'm able to provoke these samskaras, these these tendencies to judgment or to 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 look at the the world as it appears and offer no secondary meaning to the world in a sense, right? And to make snap judgments. And so he is almost, by his mere conduct of dressing himself in that way, mm. the intention, and that's what we were talking about, intention, understanding intention. His intention is to draw out the, the negative quality of superficiality and judging things for their appearance. Mm. And then as you become accustomed to this and you repeatedly experience the same thing, that the appearance is deceiving because what's really of value lies beneath the surface, mm. that becomes a value that you embed into yourself for life. Mm. And how almost unexplainably valuable is that? Mm. Like, how can you put a value on, 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 a, on a teaching like that? Because you look at the, the whole world around you and you will find that value almost always lies beneath the surface. Mm. Like the, the true meaning and essence and satisfaction and all of these things almost always requires you to push through layers and layers of things yeah. before you get there. And philosophically speaking, Maya, isn't God pervading this Maya? And aren't you supposed to pierce through the yeah. apparent perception of Maya to reach the actual perception exactly. of divinity? Yeah. And so the trivial act of him wearing fancy earrings suddenly becomes an act that leads you to the perception of the truth that lies beneath the falsehood. Mm. And then you say, that's a guru teaching, mm. right? But was the teaching meant to be that you should wear jewelry also? No. No, <laughs> it wasn't, you see? And that's that's where I really love understanding intentionality and in mm. intention and, and how that leads to an entirely different interpretation mm. of what was first criticized mm. and that second inspection praised yeah valued yeah yeah it's true but it again what you were saying it just re really requires a, a mature understanding that the the truth is often hidden it's not what is plainly available you know it's and it's also like that like for instance um the deeper secrets of your heart you wouldn't just readily share with anyone just like that true right so based on what you're saying in, you know, whatever, if you're giving a public satsang or whatever, if people but judge you based on that, they might be missing the point because that's what what you are consciously showing them. But it doesn't mean that's the whole totality of who you are. And it's the same with, for instance, scripture. There's a certain face understanding, but if we believe in, you know, that these divine authors, you know, don't reveal every everything to someone who doesn't, who would maybe ab even abuse that knowledge, right? And there's a hidden way, you know, like often, for instance, in, in wars or something, there was a certain secret, like a certain secret language, which you cannot decode unless you know the language that person is speaking, right? You, there might be they might be using code words mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. it or even a code language where it seems that they're having a conversation about whatever a glass of water but they're actually discussing something completely different yeah but it requires this mature understanding and also one one point I'd like to uh, make for instance <laughs> so, when when we when we talk about the Bhagavatam or back to this 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 topic of how to understand you know Shastra in general, I often feel like this mature understanding of how, for instance, meaning comes, how meaning is conveyed, this language of Shastra, this really gives devotees a framework of being more confident in their own path mm -hmm. and their own tradition. Because often people would criticize, oh, you're, you're supposedly, you know, uh, authority, which is, um, for instance, Bhagavatam is a, plays a big role, you no know, in Vaishnavism in general. Depends on the Sampradaya. Depends yes. on the Sampradaya, yeah. yeah. But in, in in general, when someone comes and says, um, your Krishna was doing such and such and such, or your, um, for instance, your Bhagavatam describes an animal which was talking Sanskrit. You how, believe in that stuff. Do you really believe in yeah. that? And now people are kind of shaken, um, 
quite quickly by by these kind of statements, by these kind of um, provocative statements. But if you have a mature understanding of how you understand your Sadhguru's teachings, how to understand the Bhagavad Gita, right? How to understand your own tradition, then then you're much more rooted in your own truth, no? And you're not dismissed, you're not shaken by these kind of or even you might be having these doubts the, yourself, no? Right. You shake yourself more. Right. Often you than read. Y- right. You read. Or even, or even when Guruji tells a story. Right. Often, he will tell a story where it's questionable whether that's a real event, no, <laughs> which actually happened. For instance, there's this story he t- he tells in, um, you know, when he was commenting on the Shandilya Bhakti Sutra, and he starts the story by by saying that when an eagle turns 51 years old right, right. but obviously you can go on the internet and according to you know online re- <laughs> resources an eagle never even reaches that age and guruji starts his story by saying once an eagle reaches that age and then he continues the story right, right? so you know someone might have this this thought okay he's supposed to be a sadguru why is he telling a story which is obviously factually not true right how can these how can these coexist right but also there it's not about the story it's not about the ego but the message he's trying to give right the teaching he's trying trying to convey and and the only again the only qualifier i would put to that because i agree with you is i know that someone might be listening to this and thinking how extremely convenient there's mm. an explanation for every mistake. Mm. Every mistake is more proof of, of his divinity or, the, mm. or has a way by which it can be interpreted to not be a mistake. I understand that sentiment, mm. but the way that you, you do this in a grounded way and not in an irrational way where you start to justify anything and everything because of your bias is that you have to analyze the wider context of the person who's making these claims. Mm. Because if the thought is this person is actually ignorant and you are interpreting meaning out of otherwise an ignorant person because mm. of your own wish to find meaning in something that isn't there, mm. then all you need to do is experience the person for a longer period of time to make a more fair assessment of, is that really the case, right? It's like when you see someone acting irrationally or, or abnormally to their usual conduct, and you think someone who sees only that action can say they're a crazy person because that's their only framework of analysis. But somebody who is you know, coexisted with that person for 20 years and then sees that one act knows it was intentional. It, 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 this was not an act of a, of a crazy person who's lost mm. control. This was a, a orchestrated behavior to reach some kind of intended outcome. Mm. Yeah, and, and that's the way by which you, the only way in my estimation, by which you can filter out this kind of bias that would otherwise be easily thrown as an accusation to, to people like mm. us or anybody of faith really, when they start, when they start to justify the the more outlandish or the more, let's say, at face value, strange mm. statements that are often made in mm. these religious circles. Yeah, it's the point of being an outsider or an insider to any tradition. The same thing we would go back to, circle back to that academic scholar issue that we said with Sanskrit. It's similar, you know, when you follow a certain tradition, that's really the only way how to find out whether it's truly legitimate, yeah, yeah. right? From the outside, you cannot, you cannot really say you can have your own, um, you know, reflections, you can have your own, I don't want to call it judgments, but you can have your own observations, views, observations whatever, yeah. right? But to live it, is it's only by following a certain tradition that you really know what it's like. I mean, that, that's ideal. But I would say even from an external observatory sense, because someone might say like, the price is too high, you're asking me to live this and fully commit and that mm. needs me to surrender or whatever. And I would say that is still ideal. Mm. But even just as an outsider observing and making snap judgments, Instead of observing once, observe 20 times, 50 times. Already mm. that will help disarm many of the, the preconceived judgments or preconceived ideas you had. So even, even at that level of engagement, where it's not the most profound engagement, it is a sufficient engagement to, to already start to disarm some of the first conceptions and first ideas that spring to mind when we encounter this kind of thing. Okay. Do you know what? I had a tremendous time talking about this. I think it's really interesting. I, I think... If I mean people listening to this, I hope that two or three things happen as a result of this. A that you get a deeper appreciation for the ways that scripture can can convey truth, mm. right, in multiple ways. Mm. Um, that they may have an interest in actually studying Sanskrit for for a purpose, because I think the point was made. It has to have a purpose, but even that is a purpose that I think is is not the 
the predicted purpose. Like you could say, oh, it's to speak it or to read something. It's like, no, but you can also study it to get deeper meaning right. out of things. And like, I think that was quite evident from, from this from this podcast, right? How you can have, you can apply insights from one level of expertise or from one level to learning to overall having a deeper understanding of life, of your own life. Right? I 100% agree. No, I really enjoyed it. This was, this was fantastic. Um, I said this to Rishabh Parva, I'll say it to you also. When the Siddhanta is finished and, mm -hmm. and published, I think it'd be awesome for us to to get together in, in you know, in a different setup you know, the three of us, Myron as well, and we could really unpack the Siddhanta. And I think this conversation today would be a great lens through which to do it also, because I think it's the kind of subtlety and the kind of nuance that we're trying to introduce also to the Vaishnava landscape. Not that it's never been there, don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but it's not overly emphasized. And I don't think that most people who engage with it are um, fully, you know, let's say, fully aware of of just what is in their hands if they know how to approach it and how to access it and i think that is definitely one of the spirits of which this sedant and the sampradaya was formed it's it's like how can we take the, as much as possible from all that is vaishnavism and then do away with the contradiction and extract the purest juice the purest nectar from it in a sense and i think a huge thing part of that is is this kind of process that we were describing and discussing today so i'd love to do that with you guys when when the time comes so let's do it let's do it thank you so much for today Great thank you for having me take your day take your day